What are the most compelling factors for human capital competitiveness? Having established that nations and countries and economies are built by human beings and talents. The first one, and, 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 and in coming, you know, putting this together, I, I, I started looking at myself as an, an individual. And you can look at yourself as an individual and say, if you are making a choice as to where you want to live, and where you want to put your family, where you want to start your business, where you want to grow. What would be my order of priority? Number one, security. I will not go where I don't feel safe. So, unless and until we fix our security challenges as a nation, we have not even begun on the journey of competitiveness as a nation. So, security of lives and property the beginning of the Nigerian dream and to reverse the massive brain drain and jackpot syndrome has to be security. Can our people be made safe again in our territory? Can our children be safe again in our schools? Can our streets be free of robbers and kidnappers? When I move away from physical security, the next thing would have to be food security and primary health care. Presently, not just our present is threatened by poverty and lack of food security. Unfortunately, there are huge implications for our future. One in three Nigerian-born children under the age of five is taunted physically and intellectually due to malnutrition, according to UNICEF. Similarly, and, 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 and our um, convener mentioned the issue of productivity and national productivity. Similarly, a child born in Nigeria, according to UNICEF, as of 2022, is 36%. It's going to be 36% as productive as a child born in more developed and supportive environments. For me, that's a big shock. So if you give back to a child in Nigeria, no matter the genes they inherit, no matter how hard they work, they have one thought, the productive capacity of a child born in the more supportive economies of the world. So they are, look at it this way, they have 10 fingers. Seven fingers have been crippled and made unproductive for reasons that have nothing to do with the child or with the parents of the child. That is scary. The next thing is education. So after you are safe and you have been fed, the next thing you look at is education. It's a critical tool for breaking the cycle of poverty and achieving social mobility in Nigeria. For many families, investing in education is seen as the primary route to a better future. So my father was born into a family polygamous family, very, very poor family in his village. And he got to go to school because he was a son and the first son. So the family had to ration resources and decide who will go to school and who will not go to school. And that singular decision of giving him an education made a difference to his lifestyle made a difference to the lives of his children, made a difference to the lives of his children's children. But do you know that increasingly, unfortunately, education is no longer that differentiator that it used to be in Nigeria? Because you now have people who graduate and go out of school, and years and years and years, decades after, there is no difference to their life. What can actually make the difference? And that takes me to the next point. Social mobility. This refers to, oh yes, by the way, 20 million children out of school. The figure has increased since 2022. 20 million children out of school in Nigeria. Largest num third largest in the world. Unfortunately, the other economies that, we, that came first and second are economies that are multiples of our size. So if you're looking at it as a proportion of the number of children, we're actually number one in the world in terms of children out of school. Now, let's come to social mobility. Will an education alone make a difference 
between you and let's say your father before you. Social mobility refers to the possibility for individuals and families to move upward or away from their erstwhile social status. Specifically, it refers to how a person's socioeconomic situation improves or declines relative to that of their parents or throughout their lifetime. Maybe measured in terms of earnings, your income, the social class, health, and education, sadly, majority of Nigerians are trapped from cradle to grave in a vicious cycle of poverty perpetuated by low to zero social mobility, a self-perpetuating cycle. A study by Professor Raj Chetty of Harvard University and the Brookings Institute concluded that the community where you grew up is a key determinant of your life's outcome and prospects for upward mobility, with the four top factors being Number one, poverty rates in your community. Number two, stability of your family structure. Broken home, um, dysfunctional homes versus the other. Access to better schools. And then the fourth one that really drove it home for me is social capital or economic connectedness to high income homes. And it was found to be the biggest factor. Essentially, they found that it is hard or near impossible to aspire to what you have never seen. So if you grew up in a poor community, and everybody in that community is poor like you and hungry like you, and you never get a chance to visit the people that are higher up or to see how the other side lives, your chances of getting out of that cycle are very, very low. So it sets me thinking about some of our practices in Nigeria, such as the one in which you take a child from the village and bring him to serve in your home as a house help. Or somebody from your community, you know, comes to serve in your home as maids. I began to realize that those things are not necessarily negative. It is very important for a person to have a chance to see how the other half live because that's where aspiration begins from. And so you now had programs in the US that were very deliberate about desegregating the minorities and the socially excluded, looking for ways in which you can embed them into communities so that they can have a way of seeing. So sometimes sports, for example, the ability to go and play sports with children from a richer school, a richer community. So it's high time we brought the children from Agege to come and play football with the children in Ikoi and Victoria Island because as they begin to build some kind of connection and relationship and exposure, their chances of having a future is better. There is something called the lost instance concept and the concept essentially says again it has been found that you are 10 times more likely to be an inventor if you come from the top one percent family so what then happens it means that there are millions and millions of people who have never who have not invented anything not because they are not ordinarily capable of inventing but they've never even been raised in an environment in which they can think of the possibility of inventing for me i run a charity for some of the you know nigerians here it begins to stimulate your ideas as to the things that you could do when the, the uh, a study that was done in the u.s on communities that had the highest and the lowest level of social mobility. So they took the ages and the income of people and compared with the, age, the income of their parents at that age. And a city called Charlotte had the lowest. It's, incidentally, that city is the headquarters of Bank of America. And Bank of America decided to look inward and find out what is it that we have been doing 
We've been here for so long, and yet our community has the lowest social mobility. And they checked their HR practices, and they discovered that in, they tended to hire from other communities. So they were perpetuating the same vicious cycle because the children of this community didn't, you know, they don't exactly have the same, you know, they don't have it. So we go and hire. They now decided that they will start picking students from that community, exposing them, giving them internships, training them, and gradually you saw that, you know, that mobility thing began to change. So in my hum humble opinion, the primary responsibility of government to its citizens is to prioritize the above four needs, above every other direct expenditure. Clearly, resources are scarce. Government simply cannot afford to finance every need of the people. However, if it can address security, if it can address food security, if it can address social mobility, and if it can address education, then it can begin to formulate policies that will address the remaining. So I am an investment banker. We spend, I mean, we invest significantly in infrastructure development. But what I'm saying to you is that if we don't fix the social investments that are necessary, all that infrastructure will not do anything for us. Remember that we appropriate policy framework to incentivize domestic and foreign investments. We can fix the big needs. What are these big needs? Infrastructure investment to support economic activities, industrialization to diversify away from crude oil dependency um, by formulating an industrial master plan aimed at fostering economy diversification, enhanced and strengthened justice system, fostering and incentivizing innovation and creativity. I am saying, let's fix these ones with policy, but let government focus its scarce resources. We know the resources are scarce. Focus the scarce resources on social investments. Make sure that the people are safe. Make sure that, I think we should have compulsory education at least to JS3. By the way, free and compulsory should be free and it should be compulsory. Provide education, provide the social security, provide a sense of safety and provide social mobility. Go into communities and begin to, you know, implement programs that can desegregate and mix the people up a little bit. And we also, who are in the private sector, I gave the example of Bank of America. We, the, the companies, we who are in um, the charity, uh, who run charities can do the same. If we work and we focus attention on these things, we create an environment in which then we can attract investments from outside. In conclusion, with proper planning and long-term vision, Nigeria can create an environment where success is not left to chance, but fostered by policies that encourage entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic inclusivity. Generational income growth is driven by several key factors, and these can be consciously developed with political will and sustained effort. These factors once again include education, access to capital, social mobility, meritocracy, and equal opportunities for women, youths, and those from poor households. Infrastructure development addressed largely through policies that will encourage private sector investments. Innovation and technology, encouraging innovation, particularly through technology, can be a major driver of economic growth. Countries that invest in research and development and provide infrastructure for tech st startups see higher rates of entrepreneurial success. And finally, policy stability and good governance. A stable policy environment encourages both local and foreign investments, which are crucial for economic growth. Corruption, policy inconsistencies, and political instability have historically undermined Nigeria's economic progress. By addressing these factors, our nation's families can create a foundation for consistent generational income growth allowing each successive generation to build on the achievements of the previous one and drive sustainable economic growth. As I close, 
I want to go back to a very important point that our convener made when he introduced this event today. It is not that the poor are not working. It is not that they're not earning. It is not that they're not saving. It is that nobody has taught them what they should be saving in, where they should be directing their investments to, which communities they should be mingling with, which kind of schools they should be looking to get their children, you know, attend. You know, in closing, I remember when I was raising my children. By the grace of God, my youngest is 26, so I've done a good job so far. <laughs> Thank you. When I was raising my children and I would go for their open day, after looking at their work, I would pick subject by subject and I would say, who is leading the class in this subject? And then my child will say, Tolani. And I will say, is she your friend? Child is, hmm, I said. So who is your friend? She will name, I say, when next I come to school, you and Tolani must be besties. I'll go to the next topic. Who is leading this class? Until we as Nigeria begin to foster that kind of connectedness between those who have and those who do not have, we will not begin our journey to unlocking economic potential. There is knowledge to be shared. There are connections to be shared. There are opportunities to be shared. And we are done eating alone. Thank you very much and God bless you.